Welcome, gentlemen, viewers out there. Hated greatness here on a hiatus. And the reason I was on a hiatus, well, I can show you guys actually. So, this is my external hard drive. And I had a lot of anime on here, which sucks. Also, had the videos I was recording. And what I would usually do is because I have my machine dual booted Linux and Windows. And I would record and then copy it over to this and then upload it on YouTube and Linux because Linux just runs easier on my laptop because it's old or whatever. Long story short, while copying the data over to this, this thing died. And every time I turn it on, it makes a weird sound. So I'm going to try and salvage this thing, most likely open it up, see if I can copy the data over to a newer hard drive when I buy it. But that's why there's a hiatus in the video because I recorded the video. I actually had two videos recorded and I have to redo them because I, I have no other way of accessing them because while copying it over, for some reason, the original data was ruined and I couldn't do anything with it. So I'm, re I'm redoing the videos. This is the review impressions for Tetsu Joel. No Copinary episode 11. That's what we're here to discuss right now. This episode, I'm just gonna get out, I'm gonna get the one bad thing out of the way right now. The one bad thing out of the way, the crime. And it wasn't even like there was a lot of crying. There was one real scene for it, and it was with Ikoma. I, there, it was just the way it was seeing him. I understood. I understand that he was in a moment of, you know, of just mourning, of loss. His best pal, as spoiler warning. We saw what happened at the end of episode 10. If you have not, go watch episode 10 and make sure to check out episode 10 impression video from me. He's dealing with what happened to Takumi at the end of episode 10. And it was there was a lot of crying and stuff and it bothered me just because, A, I don't cry. B, I hate crying. It, just, it always bothers me. But that was it. Everything else about this episode was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Let's start with Biba. You learn even more about what Biba's father did to him and what his father represents to him. And he even more so even more now than before. Because remember, if you remember before, I was saying I'm not so sure if Biba is this clear, clear cut and dry villain. And then after that I said, Oh, he's definitely a villain because some of the things he did. But they always had these subtle hints to something just not being right with him. And you see why that is when you watch this episode and see some of the things his father did and the rationale his father gave him for why he did the things that he did. Essentially, Biba is a product of his environment. He's a product of those who came before him. The apple didn't fall from the far, fall far from the tree. Man, eh, I don't know if that's accurate. Let's just say that his father ruined him. He had no chance of growing up to be a normal person. And you also see how intelligent this man is. Like you know that you know when he stopped the plan and predicted that the plan was happening in the last episode. Like, his plan for taking over the fortress was genius, and orchestrated to a T. Again, be, he he is one of the best villains I've seen in a series in a long time. And it's not just because of his ability or his looks or just the fact that, like I said, he's a great tactician. And he understands humanity. It's just, it's the complexity to him. He isn't a simple, oh, this guy does bad things, therefore he's bad kind of person. If for people looking at this and actually paying attention, you see, like, wait a minute, this person is not just a product of what his father did to him, but he's a product of the world that he grew up in. You know, he, he's royalty. And there's weird pressures and rules that regular people can't relate to in that. But also just the entire world in this time is bound. They're all weakened by fear. And in fact, I wasn't going crazy early watching this series because it's mentioned here. His father does something to him and what's his father's excuse for it? It wasn't me. Fear did this to you. And he says this to him as a child. So Bebo as a child is going to be confused by this. This is something he's never going to forget. And it made him into the man thing, whatever he is, that we see before us now. In addition to that, my boy, my boy, Kurusu shows up. My man's hair is wild. He just looks like a genuine Ronin right now. Even though he's not technically a Ronin, but he looks like one. Which I guess they did on purpose. Because Ayame is not there. He's trying to get back to Ayame. He's trying to get back to his master. So in the process of doing that, you know, he doesn't look as upkept and samurai-ish as he usually looks. He looks like a Ronin. He looks like 
a samurai with no master, which is a disgraceful state to be in technically. But you find out, they don't explain how he survived the fall or what happened with him and the scientists, but I mean, Kurusu's Kurusu, he survives it, of course. And somehow so did the scientist who was with him and somehow so did the contents that the scientist was holding. More on that later. Anyway, he runs into Itoma after the events of uh, that transpired episode 10. I'm not gonna, I, I don't like, I don't like spoiling too much. I try to avoid it, but some of the things I have to talk about. And also, in addition to that, Ikoma is not the same man he was after what happened in episode 10. And I don't just mean in terms of his psyche and his mentality, I mean physically. He's severely injured, and the only reason he's really alive is the fact that he's a carbonary now. But if I think, if I, if I remember correctly, in the intro video, they show him where he had that weapon, but that weapon wasn't something he was holding. There's a part of the intro where the weapon is attached to his arm. In fact, it's like his arm is weaponized. With what happened in this episode, I'm starting to see how that's happening. Watch the sequence of the plan take, uh, take place to take over the fortress. It, it's it's absolutely ah, just beautiful. Like it, The way he gets his father back, the, the initiant of the plan, what he says to his father, when he finally is able to extract revenge from him, but you see the complexity between him because he's torn. He has flashbacks to a positive memory that he had with his father as a kid. You, you see someone desecrating his father after he'd already killed him, and Bebo wasn't playing that. Bebo said, no sir, you get the Cervantes pistol that's attached to this blade, straight to the dome piece, take a nap. That's basically what happened. In addition to that, Ayame... <laughs> She's always trying to be that pillar of light. And it was, this is the first time we get to see where she's put in a situation where she can't do that. Chaos and fear have just run rampant in that room because of what Biba did. And she cannot calm people down. In fact, her uncle has to take her over and say, listen, we gotta go. Because Ayame, she's a strong woman. She doesn't seem to know fear. She's possibly one of the most fearless people in the show. From she's standing in that chaos, telling people to calm down and to try and hold on to their humanity, not realizing that it, it's not something they can get back. It's gone. Those people are lost causes. We also see the people that are on the Cortez Hujo. When they arrive at the fortress, they have a... This fortress is like the last great pillar in the land that we've seen so far in this series. At least it's the only one we've talked about. There's possibly more, especially with what happens later on. We'll get into that. This place is, they have super strict rules on who, who can enter, how they're allowed to enter, and the inspections that are done. And in addition to the inspections that we saw at, Nor at other fortresses and, um, and, and other fortresses and other towns, they don't even play. It's not a simple, oh, we inspect you for bite marks and scars if you have none, you're good. Like, no, no. You're new here. Oh, okay. Here's what's going to happen. For three days, you're in jail. Regardless. We don't care. You sit there in jail for three days, and, and then you're free. But before that, you're, you're sitting there. They don't, they don't care. And that's what they did to the members of the Cortez Ujo. And of course, be when you knew this and he utilizes it. The part at the end of the episode where Ikoma is essentially saying, you know what? The time I've mourned my friend and now I need to do what my friend would want me to do. Well, what would Takumi do, want me to do? Takumi, Takumi was always trying to support me in my fight. He wouldn't want me sitting here and crying. He'd want me to be, he'd want me to be about that action. So let's be about that action. That's that's essentially what Akoma decides for himself. And he literally, my man gets the scissors and gives himself a nice tapered fade hookup. I'm like, okay, I see you with the the, 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 the two guard. It wasn't really a guard, it was scissors, like I said, but you get what I'm saying. He hooks he hooks his, his face up to look, I guess, more stern. And it appears, and I okay, and here's why I say this. They show his glasses, and his glasses are broken. And he doesn't wear them anymore. In addition to that, his new hairstyle has some of his hair hanging over, I believe, his right eye. So maybe his right eye was injured in a fall? I'm not sure. Also, I believe the reason he's also not wearing the glasses is because he almost got to a point where now he just completely accepts that his humanity is gone. Because A, his best friend in the world, his anchor, Takumi, is gone. It's taken from him. And he wasn't taken from him by Kabane. He was taken from him by humans. So, again, like, who are you really fighting? Who's really your enemy? It's not the Kabane. It's not just the Kabane, I should say. 
regular people. Also, he's come to terms with what will happen. He knows what he has to do to kill Biba and to save his friend. And we know what happened to his friend because we saw it in, in the last episode when Hirobi was injected with uh, the accelerant. She became a, a man-made colony, a new, I believe it's called. Well, he was prepared to fight that. He knows, oh, I can't fight that as I am. That that thing is massive, it's powerful. He wants to save her. He finds out that there's ways to save her. And in order to do so, he says, I need to become more powerful than I am. I don't have time to train or wait. This has to happen now. So what does he do? He says, give me the accelerant. Well, this is weird, right? Because the scientist explains to them that the accelerant won't work on you the same way it worked on Hirobi or Mume because they're women. Male common area and female common area are different. And we find that out with what happens when the accelerant is injected to them. Male common area don't become colonies. They don't become new. They just become this really, really super uber cool looking powerful common area that uses all of its life force in a short amount of time and dies. In fact, scientists essentially says it will be quick and fast like the flicker of a candle before it burns out at its hottest, like you're struggling to stay lit. That's what's gonna happen to you. You're gonna be immensely powerful, but after that, you're gone. It's like essentially like when Guy Sensei opens the final gate and he becomes a god, but after that, his, his life source leaves him and dies. You see it was supposed to, but you know, somehow never told you came Jesus. That's what happens here. He says, I, I know what I have to do. I'm, I've come to terms with it, I'm ready. Let's do this. And it's important that he did this too, because when who's who's meeting him in the, originally, he meets him in the middle of his grief. He's feeling sorry for himself. He's basically given up. He doesn't even want to try anymore. And Kurusu is the, a man that is always about the mission. His mission is protecting a Yame. That will always come first and foremost to him. He doesn't care what the odds are. Even if he's out, he, if he's going to die trying, that doesn't cross his mind. My job is to do this. I will do this. That's that's why I Kurusu is no nonsense. So he was just angered by Ikoma just being in a state of grief and not trying to go back and fight, even after hearing everything that went down. He was shocked, he was appalled, but still, we have to go save our friends. We have to go save Ryama. And Ikoma went from, I don't know, I'm sad, to not only am I willing to go fight now, I'm willing to literally give my life, it, consciously give my life for this. <laughs> this episode, Nine and a half out of ten. Simple. I, the, the, the crying is the only thing that pissed me off. And that probably won't bother a lot of people. I'm an insensitive person, so that's why it bothers me. Most people probably won't care about that. So, again, if you have not watched this episode, go watch it. You have to watch it because it's episode 11 out of 12. There's only one more episode after this. Go check it out if you haven't. And, yeah, that, that's all I have to say. If you have any comments, leave them below. Give me any thoughts on give me your thoughts on what you guys think of Biba after this episode. Do you agree with my assessment of Biba or do you think Biba is just totally scum? Your thoughts on Ikoma, give me your thoughts on the symbolism in the episode, things I may have missed. Just give me your thoughts, period. Comment below. Hit me up on Twitter. You know where you know where to find me. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. Hit the like button. And as always, this is hated. Peace.